Okay, so yeah, thanks very much for the invitation to speak. Uh, so this will be a joint series, one and a half talks by me, uh, starting today about derived algebraic geometry with application towards derived Galois deformation theory, and then one and a half talks by Michael Harris about derived hack algebras and locally symmetric spaces and so on. And I just want to caution at the beginning that this word derived is very overloaded. So actually, the way it appears here is completely different from the way it appears here. So uh, it's just something I <laughs> I uh, I want to question about. Okay, so today today is going to be an introduction to derived moduli spaces. Um, given what happened in the previous talk, I do wonder a little bit if maybe these this is just something that everyone knows uh, in grad school these days. But back when I was a grad student, that was not the case. So I'm, I'm going to pretend the audience doesn't know any derived algebraic geometry. I apologize uh, to the experts if they're bored by that. So I'm going to begin with kind of a really, really big picture. Uh, I'm going to summarize all of classical algebraic geometry in, in one line. So it's about things called schemes. Schemes are things you build locally from things called affine schemes. And those are the same things as commutative rings. So, so there, there's my kind of one line summary of classical algebraic geometry. And from this point of view, I'm going to give also one line summary of, of derived algebraic geometry, which is that we're just going to stick the word derived in everywhere. So we're going to be interested in things called derived schemes. They're locally in the Zerski topology you know, built out of derived affine schemes. And those are the same thing as, as uh, what I'm going to informally call derived commuted rings for now. So what one sees here, the point is that kind of uh, what we're talking about is all really coming from a passage from commuted rings to some kind of more complicated notion of commuted ring. So uh, that's what I'm going to explain next. So what is a derived commutative ring? Rather than telling you the definition, I'm going to start by telling you kind of what this definition or what the definition is trying to accomplish. So I'm going to do that by a table of analogies. Uh, in this table, there's one row that we know very well, or maybe at least much more familiar. So we have these three columns. In the left, we have some kind of object, let's say an abelian group. And then in the middle column, we have some kind of derived version of that object. So for abelian groups, that would become a chain complex of abelian groups, or in other words, a chain complex of Z modules. And then in the last column, we pass to some kind of derived category. So it's the usual derived category of Z modules. You do this uh, from the middle column by inverting, you invert quasi-isomorphisms. So once you talk about chain complexes of abelian groups, you have a notion of homology. A map of chain complexes is a quasi isomorphism. If it's an isomorphism on homology, you invert those quasi isomorphisms to get the derived category. So, this is a process that we're probably relatively familiar with. And what we want to do is replicate this story where we begin instead with commutative rings. So, we're, we're trying to fill in the middle row of this table. And it, it's a, immediately a little bit non obvious, like what you would put here. You can't put chain complex because the chain complex of rings doesn't really make sense. If the kernel of a map of rings is not a ring anymore. So we're we're going to put something different. For the purposes of this talk, I'm going to put some placeal. This talk series, I'm going to put some placeal commutative rings here. And I'm going to explain kind of what that is. Uh, so, so there's a third entry, the third row in this table, which is uh, where we we'll just begin with something very simple as set. That's again a thing where it doesn't make sense to take chain complexes. They don't form an abelian category. And it turns out that um, you can talk about simplicial sets uh, and it's, it's very closely related to something which you already know, which is a topological space. So I'm actually gonna put topological space here, but I'm gonna put in parentheses that you could have put simplicial set. These are synonyms for each other, not quite the same, but they're synonyms. And they're close enough so that you would, you would actually end up with the same thing if you if you went to the third row, like either of these would give you the same drive category at the end. So that's usually called S for spaces, or these days sometimes people call it anima or, or infinity group poise, whatever. So the point I wanted to make from this is that this notion of a simplicity commutative ring, you can basically think of it as a synonym for topological commutative ring. That's, that's like the type of object that it is. That's maybe. If you haven't seen Simplicio before, then that's the kind of the closest thing in your experience that you have seen. 
So when one passes from sets to topological spaces, then the additional algebraic structure that you get analogous to homology for chain complexes is uh, homotopy groups. You get higher homotopy groups when you go to topological spaces. And similarly, from, when you go from commutative rings to simplicity commutative rings, you get higher homotopy groups. And we'll say a map of simplicity commutative rings is a quasi-isomorphism if it's an isomorphism of homotopy groups. And then we're going to go from, uh, from kind of simplicity commutative rings to this drive category by inverting those things. So I'm, I'm going to name the entry which goes here SCR for simplicity commutative ring. But it's it's important to remember that this is not this is not sort of the most naive category of simplicity commutative rings, but the thing that you get from it by inverting these quasi-isomorphisms. Okay, so uh, I'm going to slowly scroll down, but uh, if there's questions about <laughs> how to interpret this table, then please feel free to ask. So, um, so, so the, the key takeaways that I want to make here. Uh, maybe first is that uh, so first is that the word simplicial is uh, synonymous to topological. So you haven't seen it before, then you know, in your head, you can round it to topological as far as intuition goes. And so in particular, uh, as we discussed, uh, a simplicity committed ring, an object of this category, has a ring of homotopy groups. So uh, a priori, you, you get one homotopy group for each degree, but then because you have a kind of ring structure, topological commutative ring, uh, that, that collection of homotopy groups itself has a ring structure, it's a graded commutative ring structure. Uh, and among these, the classical rings are characterized by the property that they only have homotopy groups in degree zero. So I'll say pi i equals zero when i is greater than zero. Um, okay. So, so these first three po points are all about like what is a simplicity commutative ring. Next, I want to make a point about like this category. So, so we're doing two things here really. We're not just saying like there's there's a new kind of object. There's also a category that we're interested in, especially for the purposes of moduli theory. We'll be interested in functors out of that category. So I want to make the point that like by inverting these quasi isomorphisms, you are kind of implicitly deriving all sorts of functors. So uh, functors out of this category are kind of implicitly, I'll say that in quotes, derived. Just like when you take functors out of the usual category of, of uh, derived uh, chain complexes of abelian groups, then really what we mean are derived functors. There's no other kinds of functors that make sense. So uh, just, just to sort of tell you how this will come into play, when we eventually talk about modular spaces, we'll be talking about functors out of this category. And, and one should treat this with some kind of caution. So um, it's not as naive as, as you might first guess. So for example, if we want to say like, let's take GL1 of a topological commutative ring, it's not going to be the topological group of its units because this expression isn't really homotopy independent. It's, uh, it's not really preserved by isomorphisms of topological groups or topological rings. So this is a little too naive. So this is just a remark that like, we should remember there's secretly some kind of process of injective and projective resolutions and things like that, uh, that we're used to from homological algebra. Okay. So at this point, um, so I think I've provided some kind of um, skeleton for like what, what the definition of simplicity of commutative rings will try to accomplish. I haven't given it to you yet. And you might think that I'm going to give it to you soon, 
So I just want to sort of ambush that hope right now and tell you that I'm not going to tell you the definition. I have no intention of doing it later in this talk or the next one. Uh, if you really want to see it, it is in the appendix to the, to the notes for this uh, summer school. However, I, I don't think it will be helpful if, if you haven't seen this kind of abstract homotopy theory before. So, so I'm not withholding it because I'm mean, I'm withholding it because I, I think it'll be actually kind of more damaging to see it than, than to not see it. Um, and so for, for example, like the notion of deriving we're talking about here is actually quite different from the one that appeared in the previous talk. So in, the, in terms of like formalisms that one uses to define these things, actually there's, it's somewhat artificial, I would say. We, we shouldn't worry too much about the details of the definitions and just try to get some grasp on uh, what is the overall picture. So if you really have to see a definition, I pulled one up for you. This is the definition of a cat. Uh, I wrote this here because I, I wanted to emphasize the point that if you had never seen a cat before and you, then you read this, you would still kind of not know what a cat was at the end of it. So th this, this is not what we're going to try to do. We're not going to try to give definitions. Instead, we are going to do things like look at pictures, uh, look at examples, and uh, discuss some specific features and try to get a sense of things that way. Oops, I meant, I meant for this to be. This is what we don't want to do, and this is what we're going to do. OK. <laughs> so uh, are there any questions? Okay, so in that case, let me proceed. So I want to talk a little bit about pictures, pictures of uh, simplest of commutative rings. Actually, what I mean by that is, so as I said, you can talk about derived affine schemes, and those are just kind of equivalent to simplest of commutative rings by the usual like kind of thing. You just say one category is anti-equivalent to the other. So let's talk about sort of how you would visualize geometrically the spectrum of a of a simplest of commutative ring. And let's talk about it in analogy to a situation that we already understand. So there's this analogy that the relationship between a derived scheme and a scheme is quite analogous to the relationship between a scheme and a reduced scheme. So in, in this analogy, you know, these two are playing a similar role and these two are playing a similar role. Okay, so first there are some formal similarities. Um, when you have a reduced scheme, you can of course regard it as, as a scheme that more broadly may not be reduced. And when you have a scheme, you can also view it as a derived scheme, which is just happens to be classical. Okay, so intuitively, um, this comes from the fact that when you have a ring, which is just an ordinary commutative ring, you could view it as a topological ring, which just happens to be discrete. So you put the trivial topology on it. Um, Going in the other direction, given a scheme, you can extract its underlying classical or underlying reduced. And similarly, given a derived scheme, you can extract its underlying classical. And these families of functors have similar formal properties. One is that one is the adjoint of the other, blah, blah, blah. So I think of this as being quite analogous. The, the way that a, a scheme, you can think of it as a reduced scheme plus some kind of non-reduced structure. And similarly, a derived scheme, you can think of it as a, as a scheme, a classical scheme plus some kind of derived non-reduced structure. So let's see an example. So um, here's the kind of simplest, uh, some simple way that a non-reduced scheme arises. You just write down equations like y equals x squared. There's that. And then let's say we impose y equals zero as well. So in the classical world, uh, we're just going to, sorry, in the reduced, the context of reduced schemes, we get an intersection, which is just a point. But if we take this intersection in the world of schemes, then we'll see some non-reduced structure, like a little bit of infinitesimal fuzz at that point, which reminds us that it's supposed to be a scheme of length two. So we learn to visualize a scheme as like, Reduce thing plus some fuss. And similarly, um, here's an example of a derived scheme. So I'm going to take y equals zero, 
And then I'm going to somehow intersect it with itself again, y equals zero, impose it twice. So in the world of classical schemes, it doesn't do anything. You just get this same y equals zero line back. When the world derives schemes, if you take this intersection, then it acquires a certain amount of derived fuzz. And that fuzz in particular tells you that thing is actually zero dimensional, um, like, like it would be if you had taken two lines in more general position. Okay, so uh, by the way, this underlying classical construction at the level of rings so locally, it comes from the fact that you can take a, a simplicity commutative ring or topological commutative ring R, and uh, you send it to a discrete ring, which is just its ring of connected components. So, so then you glue up this construction and that's how you, how you make this underlying classical scheme. Okay, so if there's no interruptions for questions, I will move on. And now uh, that we have some basic pictures in mind, I want to discuss some finer characteristics of, of these um, simplicity commutative rings. So maybe to orient ourselves, I'll remind you that there's kind of two algebraic invariants, two families of algebraic invariants, which we assign to topological spaces we can either consider the homotopy groups or the homology groups. And analogously, for a simplicity commutative ring, oops, for a simplicity commutative ring, let's call it curly R, we can make two analogous algebraic invariants. We can make, as I already mentioned, the homotopy groups, which is a graded commutative ring. Um, or we can make something which is called the cotangent complex. So I'll put that here. So this is the cotangent complex. And what is it? It's, it's, a, it's a complex, so it's an object. We could say it's an object of the derived category of quasi-coherent sheaves of R modules. Okay, I guess I don't... Uh, the right category of R modules. And this is the analog of, of homology for simplicity commutative rings. So we've already talked about this first invariant. The second invariant is actually a very important one in this story. Um, it's actually something which is already interesting and you know, makes sense in this kind of very classical for ordinary commutative rings. Um, that story kind of predates Corvallis, but I think you know maybe it's not so well known. So I'm going to briefly review it anyway, um, just to just to sort of set some notation to orient ourselves on what's coming. I'm always going to use kind of Roman letters, like like here, for classical objects, like classical rings or classical schemes, so on. And I'm going to use calligraphic letters for the things of a derived nature, derived rings, implicit rings, or, or derived schemes. Okay, so here, here's a brief review of this, this thing, the potential complex. So it's, it's actually a thing we can make more generally associated to any morphism. Let's, let's begin by discussing morphism of schemes, let's say x to y. Then there's the cotangent complex. It's a, an object of the derived category of quasi-coherent sheaves on X. And it's, it, uh, one of the motivations for it is that it governs the deformation theory of F. So if you ask yourself like, what are the automorphisms of F or what are the deformations of F or what are the obstructions to deforming F? They're answered by various cohomology groups of this complex. So, um, here are some examples which can elucidate the structure of this thing. Uh, its zeroth cohomology is, is the usual Kähler differentials. You can think of it as some kind of derived functor of Kähler differentials. Um, if F is smooth, then that's all there is to it. So it, 
this thing with is complex, but then specialized to achieve quantum degree zero, which is then the, the usual cotangent sheaf. Another case where it behaves nicely is a regular embedding. Um, so a closed embedding cut out by a regular sequence. In this case, uh, X has a normal bundle on Y, and this cotangent complex, well, it has nothing degree zero by, by what we said in point one. But uh, it has some stuff in degree negative one, namely it's that it's the co-normal bundle, but kind of shifted to be in degree negative one. Okay. So uh, also this cotangent complex turns out to behave well with respect to compositions. So when you compose two morphisms, you can kind of say in terms of each, the cotangent complex of each, what is the cotangent complex of the composition? So when, that, that basically tells you what it should look like for compositions of smooth morphisms and regular embeddings. Um, the things that you get from composing these two types of maps are called local complete intersections, LCI morphisms. So the examples we've said so far lead us to see that for any LCI morphism, this cotangent complex is perfect in degrees negative one and zero is for LCI morphisms of schemes. This, this pretty much exhausts the list, the, the list of uh, possibilities in which this cotangent complex is well behaved, as long as we're talking about classical schemes. So out, outside of this case, this thing is usually horrible. It usually has infinite tor amplitude. Um, so basically it's a kind of funny situation. If this thing can, it can either have amplitude like zero, one, two, or infinity. Um, and if it's not you know, very nice, then the answer is infinity. Okay, so this cotangent complex also exists for maps of derived schemes or stacks or derived stacks. Actually, um, actually, even to construct this complex for classical schemes, one kind of needs to use this derived theory, it needs to use Simplicity commutative rings. And that's one of the original ways in which these things were applied. Okay, so uh, just to sort of summarize, there's a little picture here. What is it a picture of? This is a picture of the derived category in some sense. It's um, so you know if you have a complex, it could have degree, it could have stuff in degrees from negative infinity to infinity. That's what's being marked here. And just to kind of Orient my conventions. For me, uh, a map which is kind of represented by schemes, so the cotangent complex would be lying in non positive degrees. Um, and, and typically, it's in infinitely many degrees, like this. But in very nice cases, like if it's if the thing is kind of represented by, if it's a smooth morphism, then, then this complex actually just becomes a sheaf in one degree. Um, if it's an LCI morphism, a little more generally, then it's in two degrees. Basically, in any in any other case, at least when you're finding finding these assumptions, if the map is roughly on my schemes and it's in infinitely many degrees, and then if you're going to allow yourself to be like Arden stacks, it could even kind of extend into positive degrees, and we won't need to consider anything more than that. Um, for derived schemes, it's the same. It, it's it's uh, it's in non-positive degrees, except uh, this principle doesn't apply for derived things. So it'll turn out that it's quite quite natural to come up, up with maps of derived schemes where cotangent complex has amplitude three, four, five, whatever. And so, <clears throat> oh, we can't see the bottom of the page. It says in the chat. Okay, so I'll try to scroll a little further then in the future. Um, okay, so in fact, what, what we're going to see is that the cotangent complex, it, it turns out to be kind of simpler for derived objects than for classical objects, uh, as was kind of hinted at here. And so that, that's going to be one of the technical advantages of working derivedly. One final definition, um, if this cotangent complex is perfect, then we can define the tangent complex to be its dual. 
So uh, the relationship between these two things is exactly the same as the relationship between cotangent spaces and tangent spaces. One is just one is the dual of the other. Um, I, I prefer positive numbers, so I, I like it. When we talk about tangent complexes, usually things will be in positive degrees, um, and, and also kind of certain certain things will be more natural with phrases in terms of the tangent complex. So that's, that's one advantage, maybe the only advantage of introducing this this other definition. Uh, are there any questions so far? Seems like no questions from, from the hall. Okay, great. So now let me resurrect this picture, which I had before, which was that um, we have this cotangent complex. Um, when I say of a ring, I mean like of a ring over Z. So respect to the map to the final object. <clears throat> so these is two invariants, homotopy groups and uh, and cotangent complex. And as one might expect from these analogy, uh, both of these are kind of very strong invariants that basically detect isomorphisms. So for example, when we have a map of simplicity commutative ring, or really, oh, sorry, I should be careful here. A map in this category uh, is an isomorphism if and only if well, one, one criterion is that it's an isomorphism on homotopy groups. Okay, so this first set of algebraic invariants detects isomorphisms. This statement is basically a tautology. Uh, it's, 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 well, depending on your point of view of how this category is constructed, it's basically rigged to be true. Another perspective is that um, uh, it's an isomorphism if the map on pi zero, so the map on the classical truncation or underlying classical rings is an isomorphism and the map of cotangent complexes is an isomorphism. This statement now is a little more interesting and it's kind of analogous to the classical Hurevich theorem in topology, which is, which is about this situation. Uh, weak equivalence can be detected on homotope groups or homology groups given, given some good behavior of flow line. Groups. So let me not uh, tell you the proof, but just sort of explain like why this is possible. So um, if you consider you're comparing these two rings R and R prime, and you consider how they map to some other ring, you basically want to show that they have the same maps to some other test object. And first you ask yourself, like, how do they map to a, a classical thing? And that's completely controlled by the classical truncation. And so the fact that they're this isomorphism means that they have the same maps to some classical thing. Then on top of that, you need to ask yourself, like they have the same maps to, to derive rings to, to other simplicial commutative rings. But as I explained, kind of think of a uh, simplicial commutative ring as being a, an infinitesimal thickening, derived infinitesimal thickening of a, of a classical ring. So um, once you know that they have the same map to the classical stuff, then the information of how they map to non-classical things is entirely deformation theoretic. And so it's controlled by the cotangent complex. And so the fact that these cotangent complexes are isomorphic uh, tells you that they have the same deformation theory as well. OK. So that was, that was a very brief sketch, but hopefully it provides some, some intuition. <clears throat> Let, let's go through an example. So we haven't really studied in examples so far derived schemes. Um, and an important construction which will also come up later is the derived fiber product. Okay, so let's keep this as classical for as long as we can. So suppose you just have three classical schemes, X, Y, and Z map to each other. Then there's this construction, the derived fiber product. Uh, what is it? Well, what is the usual fiber product? It's some kind of thing locally at the level of rings it's built out of tensor product. This thing, this derived fiber product, put an H for homotopy, it's locally built out of a derived tensor product. So that, that's some kind of tensor product in the category of SCR. Uh, let's discuss what it, what it looks like. So some of its features. So for example, we're saying this thing will have homotopy groups. Let's say we take a derived fiber product of three classical rings, R, T, and S. Then the higher homotopy groups will be, as groups, they will just be the Tor groups. Thank you. 
this doesn't really specify the ring structure that exists on their sum, but it's some information. And in particular, if you take i equals zero, you see that like the classical truncation, which is the pi zero, is just the usual tensor product. And so the classical truncation of the dry fiber product, or underlying classical, I think is what I called it before, underlying classical. This dry fiber product is just the usual fiber product. I'll put CL for classical besides that. So another thing we can ask about, we can ask about the second step in period. So we can ask ourselves, like, what is the tangent complex of this dry fiber product? And uh, it turns out that it's a simple formula to compute this, which is uh, you kind of you just take the tangent complex of x, and you add it to the one for y. Um, you have a map from these two tangent complexes for z. This all occurs after you pull back to the derived fiber product. Um, and then then you take the fiber in the usual sense of derived categories. So these are objects in the derived category of quasi coherent sheaves. Take the fiber uh, or shifted cone. This is another way that this construction is called. And, and that's what the answer is. And actually, this answer is pretty nice. Like it's it's relatively simple. Even if you compare to uh, how you compute the tangent space of a classical fiber product, it, it can be kind of complicated. Like it depends on whether certain maps are transverse to each other or how non-transverse they are. And so this is, in some sense, a very clean answer. OK, uh, I'm going to pause for a few seconds again in case there are any questions. Yeah, maybe I ask, uh, is it possible to give the simplest example of, uh, you know, derive scheme of points i mean uh, these objects in this category is it possible to give uh, you know, what is the simplest example oh um so an example is let's make an example of this nature so yeah let, let's do points so you could take like let's uh make some real estate here okay so we can take like zero times over a1 with zero this thing, this thing looks derived because it's like a non-transverse intersection. Like you, you know, there's going to be higher torque groups. Uh, so if we put an H here, this is some derived scheme of a yeah with with, with higher homotopy groups and uh, kind of it, if I were to draw a picture, it's just the origin again, but some kind of derived buzz on it. What's the ring that it corresponds to? Uh, well, it's it's it is. We we know what home groups are here, so it's some kind of like exterior algebra uh, on one generator, and that generator has home group degree one. So th this is one way in which we'll come and encounter this kind of drive space is that we take some sort of fiber products intersections and we have no idea whether they're transverse or maybe we know they're not transverse. Uh, that, that, that can give rise to these drive structures. Is this example satisfactory? Yeah, it's okay. Okay, well, we'll see more examples later. So. <laughs> uh, Okay, so I just want to make a loose analogy about like what we're doing, right? So it, it seems like we're making our life complicated for ourselves. Like there was already algebraic geometry was pretty complicated. And then with this drive stuff, this high homotopy groups, that seems to be worse. So I want to make a loose analogy here, which is that again, in the world of topological spaces, like there's these two things, homotopy groups and homology groups. And you can ask for things which are kind of simple from the perspective of homotopy groups. 
the simplest things are called Eilenberg McLean spaces. So the things that only have one non-trivial homotopy group, positive degrees. And okay, so an example is something called KZN. But it turns out that if you ask what's the homology of this thing, that's incredibly complicated. Um, and kind of in a similar vein, if you say, okay, throw that, let's throw that out the window. Let's look at spaces with very simple homology. Okay, those are the simplest ones are called Moore spaces. They have only one non-trivial homology group. An example is a sphere. Uh, then, then you start asking yourself, like, what's the homotopy groups of this thing? Then it's again extremely complicated. So in some sense, like something which is simple from one perspective is very complicated from the other perspective. And, and the analogy is that this is what's going on here for us as well. So we have these things called schemes. Maybe we feel more comfortable with them. We like them, classical schemes. They have simple homotopy groups. Their homotopy groups are just in degree zero. Um, but as I said, their cotangent complex can turn out to be something very complicated. Deformation theory is very complicated. And, and typically in infinitely many degrees. And the philosophy which is underlying this discussion is that Uh, natural map modulized spaces. Modulized spaces arising in nature should be in this column, actually. That is to say, it's empirically, it's better for them to, okay, then, it's better them to, for them to have kind of simple homology or simple tangent complexes rather than simple homotopy groups. And uh, <laughs> the simplest kinds of non like degenerate examples are things that are called quasi smooth. Right, schemes. So these will, if you really have both simple homotopy and simple homology, then your thing is just like a discrete, your topological space would be like a point or something. If you really have simple homotopy groups and simple tangent complex, then your scheme would have to be LCI or smooth. Um, but the, the next thing, next most interesting example is where we keep the tangent complex simple, but, but we allow it to become derived. And so that's what this quasi smooth thing is. And I believe this term came up already in, in David and his talk a little bit earlier. So what I'm going to do next is explain to you what it means. <clears throat> okay, so what is quasi smooth? So it's basically a derived version of, of LCI, local complete intersection. So uh, recall that we said that local complete intersections are characterized by the property that the cotangent complex is only in two degrees. Okay, that's, that's for schemes. If it stacks, you, you allow it in kind of a positive degree as well. So, um, so definition is that a map of maybe derived schemes or even derived stacks is going to be quasi smooth if the cotangent complex is perfect in degrees at least negative one. Okay, so here's this little picture again. The thing, it, it, it's, uh, it's allowed to go above degrees negative one. Basically, in practice, it means it'll be in degree negative one, zero, or one, n one. But a priori, remember, it, it could have been um, in all these negative degrees. And typically, for maps of schemes, it will be in all these negative degrees. And we're saying we're not going to allow those. Just by dualizing, it's the same statement to say that the tangent complex is perfect in degrees less than a positive one. In practice, this is, um, yeah, as I said, the, sometimes the answer, like it's more natural to write down what the tangent complex is. So just make a mark here. And uh, just to sort of reemphasize that point, if we're talking about maps of classical things, then this quasi-smoothness condition is equivalent to, oops, under maybe plus Ethereum, is equivalent to a uh, book of complete intersection. But kind of the empirical fact is that local complete intersections are, are quite rare. So they're quite uh, hard to come by for maps of classical schemes, whereas they'll be quite ubiquitous for, for derived things. <laughs> okay. Also, there's a little remark that um, this definition I gave up 
uh, I gave above was uh, was about potential complexes, but it has some other possibly more intuitive description, which is that uh, it it means that locally you look like the derived fiber product of three smooth and classical things. Okay, so there's an X, Y, and Z, all smooth and classical. You take a derived fiber product, and the statement is that that anything which looks locally like that is quasi smooth, and vice versa, anything which is quasi smooth looks locally like this thing. So in the particular, this this uh, gives a good way to produce examples. So what are examples, right? So let's, let's do a kind of similar example again. Um, we could take y equals zero inside a two. Take the derived intersection with itself. That thing is definitely going to have higher tor groups, so it's going to have a derived nature. But then these are all smooth and classical, so this thing. This direct intersection. What are we calling that? It's the, it's the call it box. This thing will be quasi smooth. Uh, okay, so I also want to say that there's a kind of natural notion of dimension, or sometimes called virtual dimension, for for quasi smooth morphism specifically. So you you could put the it's the order characteristic of this potential complex. Or uh, in this picture, it would be like dimension of x plus dimension of y minus dimension of z. So this is sometimes called the expected dimension because it, sorry, this is the other one. Uh, this is sometimes called the expected dimension because it's like what you would expect to see if this thing, if this fiber product were transverse. And so in this, in this example, it would be uh, one plus one minus two. So the, the virtual dimension of this thing would be zero, even though you know when you take it, uh, this fiber product in classical schemes, you obviously get something one dimensional. Okay, so the importance of this notion and uh, is something called the hidden smoothness philosophy. So I think this is a philosophy which was first kind of um, maybe articulated by Balancing. Uh, this is what I found a lot. <laughs> Balancing, Drenfeld, uh, Delin, Drenfeld, Kansevich, the 80s before this formalism had been invented, and they had already anticipated that, um, that various naturally occurring moduli spaces, which easy LCI or failed to have the correct dimension, they should admit kind of natural derived enhancements, which are quasi smooth and have kind of the correct virtual dimension. Um, so what I'm saying here is like the classical thing doesn't look right. And so the belief is that there's some other kind of derived thing, which looks like it has the correct dimension and correct smoothness property. And then when you take its underlying classical, then you get something that looks, um, that recovers the original thing. And the fact that taking the underlying classical is not really a very geometrically well-behaved op operation explains why the classical moduli space doesn't look too good. So let me try and illustrate this through an example, something which has more or less come up uh, in earlier lectures in this conference. So let's take a Riemann surface C, closed Riemann surface P and G. What should be the moduli space of, of Betty G hat local systems on C? Okay. Here's, my, here's my Riemann surface. What, what is a Betty G hat local system? By that I mean representations of the fundamental group. Or that's that's at least one possible definition. So I'm thinking, you know, let, let's let's take the space of um, representations of the fundamental group into G hat. Okay, then we should quotient by G hat uh, conjugation, and we want to equip this set with a moduli space structure. How are we going to do that? Well, what is the fundamental group of C? The fundamental group of a surface of genus G, closed surface of genus G, is like uh, has well. You can look it up in textbooks and you'll usually find this kind of presentation, A1 through AG, B1 through BG, and then you have some kind of product of commutators equals one. So, so how would you parameterize the representations of this thing? Well, each of these AIs and BIs is an element of this dual group G. So, you, know, you can parameterize those by 2G copies of this thing. Let me get more real estate here. So 
2G copies of the group. And then you need to kind of, you know, cut out a subset of this where this relation is satisfied. Okay, so we, this relation defines some map from this G hat 2G to the G hat. This G hat 2G parameterizes A1 through AG, B1 through BG, and you take the product of the commutators, and you need it to land in the uh, land in the identity. So this modulized space worth we're thinking of, let's just call it M Betty framed. Um, you can think it's maybe it should be this fiber product, right? And this thing here is a regular embedding, and this thing is smooth. So uh, maybe your hope is that this thing is, is, is like LCI. This, maybe this map you hope is still a regular embedding. And then the expected dimension would be uh, so first I'm going to put 2G dimension of this group. Then I need to subtract the dimension of this group because I'm forcing this map to land in the identity. And then actually, this is only the frame version. Like this parameterizes actual homomorphisms, whereas only one representations. So really uh, the thing that I'm after should be like, this thing is the quotient of the frame version by conjugation action. So I should subtract this again. Okay, so you, you could hope that we've we've constructed a nice moduli space that has this dimension and it's LCI because it's you know there's a regular sequence and then you you define it in something smooth, but it turns out not not to work. Uh, so this the regular sequence here just doesn't really pull back to a regular sequence here in general. And so the dimension I can't really say what the dimension would be. It, it's it's wrong, but it can be corrected by making the thing derived. So if you, instead of this naive fiber product, you take the derived fiber product, then you're going to get the thing which we actually take as the correct moduli space of Betty G high local systems, for example, for the purposes of uh, geometric languages. Oh, they still can't see the bottom part of the page. Um, can you see it now? Yeah, we. You mean this expected dimension equals to two G? This equation we can see well. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I'm just the, getting some the red patterns. line. We can see that you try to draw a red line, right? Cool. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to try to keep the writing centered more. Then. Okay. So, um, any questions? Yeah, there seems to be a question. One second. Sorry, I, I have a. I, I was lagging. I mean, I mean, could you please remind us the definition of perfect amplitude that you mentioned when you talk about Gaussian smoothness? And uh, do you have any assumptions of finite presentation there? Uh, wait. Oh, in the definition of quasi smooth. Yes, you 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 use something like perfect amplitude. Yeah, yeah. Okay, this is not the, necessarily the most general definition possible, and also possibly not not always the one you find in the literature. But yeah, I'm going to assume things are finally presented, and that perfect means locally represented by an actual perfect complex. But anyway, uh, I, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Like, okay, we're, we're not going to. I, I mean, at home, out of I mean, I I can't remember the definition of of perfect amplitude that. Tor amplitude. Tor amplitude is no, no, no. Tor amplitude is tensor. I mean, perfect. You you need some perfect amplitude, right? I, I, I'm I'm confused. Uh, you said no, a perfect no. smaller than something, a uh, bigger than minus one, or no? I think I said it's it's represented by a perfect complex, locally represented by a perfect complex in degrees less than minus one. Okay, thanks. Actually, I think I said bigger than minus one. Okay. Anyway, so, um, okay, so we're, we're going on to, oh, was there another question? Uh, no, seems okay. Okay, so we're going to move on to derive moduli spaces, and, and there's a game we're going to play here, and the game is that you're given, you're given a classical moduli space, Roman M, 
and you want to somehow or another figure out uh, a nice quasi smooth Dirac modulus space early in. Um, okay, so so originally I think in the plan for this lecture there's going to be a little section motivation of like why we want to do this, but it turns out that sort of a large number of talks have already have already made mention of this kind of thing. So I think I, maybe now the motivation is to understand what was happening in those talks. And uh, I think I can add to this list Zhu, Emerton, Chow Lee's talk, Venkatesh, and uh, Ben's V now as well. <clears throat> and uh, this problem is not really like very well defined. Okay? There's, there's many ways to start with something classical and write down something quasi smooth and derived, which kind of then recovers it after taking the underlying classical. So let me, let me oops. Just to give an example, you could take any ring, any ring you want, any classical ring, let's say K-algebra, and um, let's say we can take any presentation of the form X1 through Xm and then quotient by whatever re relations we want. Obviously, such a thing could be like arbitrarily singular. Then you could, you could cook up some kind of derived fiber product which um, reproduces spec R uh, when you take its underlying classical. So let's just say we, we use these like Fs to define some map from AM to AN. We take the derived fiber product over zero. Then uh, that thing, when you take its classical truncation, is the usual fiber product and that's gonna be spec R. So clearly we can, and we pick different presentations, we're gonna get different derived things which have the same classical, underlying classical. So, so clearly this problem is not really well defined. But nevertheless, in practice, um, in practice, like there's some more heuristics which which rigidify the problem, and the main one is that we should do this in such a way that the tangent complex is meaningful. Uh, so, so the main thing we're after is that the tangent complex of this guy, who knows what it is, but it's probably some kind of horrible mess. But this this thing we want its tangent complex to be something nice, and we usually have in mind what we want it to be. So the pattern for this is that typically, uh, typically you will already have some information. So given the point of this moduli space, you'll be able to compute its tangent space. I just, you know, you evaluate on the dual numbers. And the answer would typically be some kind of cohomology group. And then you can also, if your thing is stacked, you can look at its automorphisms. And uh, you'd like to see an answer which looks like the cohomology group one degree lower. And then if you know what this means, you can also usually figure out something about the obstruction group for your space, maybe not determined completely, but you, you, you would like to see that the obstruction group is some subgroup of the next homology group. And then at this point, with some caution, uh, you are, you're ready to say that the tangent complex should be kind of the homology complex, uh, which, which reproduces like these homology groups. And once you've decided what the tangent complex of your space is, and you know, kind of, you start out knowing what you want the, under, the underlying classical thing to be, then, as was discussed earlier, the problems become quite rigid. You have a map between two things, it's isomorphism on classical things, on classical underlying things, and also on the tangent complex. Then it is an isomorphism. Okay, so that that's that's a little abstract. Let, let's see examples. Let's skip this example. This is not that much time. Let's talk about the main example we're going to be interested in later, which is the Gawa deformation functor. So this thing is um, we're, we're interested in making like a derived version of this, but let's first write down like what the usual version is. So you have a global field F. Okay. Then you have some set of places S and F, and then you have some kind of residual representation given to you. This is all given. Okay, so it, it's unramified outside S, meaning it's, we can say it's, it's defined on the fundamental group of OF inverted places in S going to P points of G hat. So <clears throat> then what is the Gawa deformation functor? I just don't know if it's come up in this conference yet, but it, uh, it sends A to deformations of this row bar to 
g hat of a. So in other words, you give lifts of this residual representation to some ring a, uh, which is augmented over fp. Okay, so technically, it's a functor defined on the category of Artinian local ZP algebras augmented over FP. It's kind of a mouthful. Okay, so that is what this usual class level deformation functor is. Then you argue that it's representable, and then you produce the kind of Galois deformation ring, which was mentioned in the talks of Cariani and Emerton and G and Hellman. So, uh, so now, like I said, we want to want to turn this nice little classical deformation functor into something derived. And how are we going to do it? And we're first going to try to figure out what its tangent complex should be by looking at tangent space and automorphisms and instructions to this classical functor. So let's say let's say you had some actual row. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let me. Let me just pick a special case for simplicity. So what, what is the tangent space to this functor at this original row? And the answer turns out to be uh, cohomology of the adjoint. So it's first cohomology of the adjoint representation. Um, also the automorphisms it's going to fit our pattern here. It's automorphisms are going to be H0, uh, the adjoint. There could be some slight subtlety depending on how you want to adjust for the center. Uh, the obstructions, this is a computation, possibly computation by measure. It's going to be an H2 of this by one. And so this is telling us that we should try to construct our, our derived deformation functor so that it's tangent complex. Should be um, R gamma of the pi one O F S and rho and then shifted by one. And um, this technically isn't a construction, but like I said, it's it's information which already rigidifies the question of who, who this is pretty strongly. Um, let's see, what do I want to do in the remaining? I think I have two minutes. So uh, let's see, what should I say here? So I'm just going to leave this as it is for now. We'll, co we'll come back and pick up this thread next time. But uh, in the last part, uh, I would like to zoom ahead and uh, address the following issue. So this is something where you start seeing it and then you're kind of paranoid that it's everywhere. So you know, why are we deriving this moduli space and not whatever other moduli space? Uh, there's plenty of moduli spaces came up in this conference. So let me just tell you a little heuristic about when not to derive. So the heuristic is that if your thing, if your M is already local complete intersection of the correct dimension, then there's no need to derive it. Um, and more precisely, the mathematical statement here is that if there were a derived thing which continued to be quantum smooth, which also had the correct dimension, then it would be the same thing, and also had this as its classical implication, then it would actually be the same thing as this. Um, and just to give some examples, so we have seen several examples uh, in this conference. Generally speaking, they were moduli of local Galois representations. Okay, so not like this. The thing above was global, global field. In the local case, it turns out that these things are basically um, don't need to be derived. So uh, if F is a local field, oops, residue characteristic P, then um, if you consider mod L or L addict representations, uh, as in the lectures of Dat and Schulze, they explain that the moduli space, they call Z1, uh, that thing was LCI of the correct dimension. So no need to turn it into a derived thing. And also I think Toby G explained that the Emerton G stack, be like L equals P situation, 
is also LCI of the correct dimension. So that thing also doesn't need to be derived. Um, okay, so I think I'm just out of time. Uh, there, there is a mathematical statement to this heuristic, which I didn't have time to explain, but um, I will also pick up on that next time on maybe the Q&A. So thanks for your attention for now. I'll stop here. Uh, if anyone has any questions for Tony, just put their hands and I'll pass you the mic. Uh, I have one live question. Uh, this example of uh, y equal to self intersection of y equal to zero. Uh, first, I want to ask like, what's the um, extra thing we get by taking the derived self intersection? And second, is is this has any to, anything to do with like? The fact that generically uh, intersection of two lines in a plane is uh, a point. Um. Yes. Yeah. So actually, maybe I'll, I'll I'll use that. Okay. So. Uh, right. This is the okay. I was going to address this. In this there's this going to be this section about like why do we do any of this? Um. So th this is a good question. Uh. Where did that thing go? Actually. It doesn't matter. Okay, so so something you might want, for example, is to do like intersection theory in a very uniform way, like Bayes-Lewis theorem. We like Bayes-Lewis theorem. Um, you know, it says like degree d. The one curve in P two, and you intersect it with the degree d two curve. B2 and you get you know B1 times D2 intersection number if you count correctly. And so you could have the perspective that like I really want this statement to be true without kind of weird hypotheses. And it just isn't true because of this self-intersection phenomenon. And if you do it in a derived way, then kind of it is true <laughs> in some sense. Um, so that would I would say is like, you know, it, and and also it is. It is, as you say, uh, one way we understand intersection theory is that when you intersect two things, it should kind of be invariant under some sort of small deformation of the situation. So if you can perturb the problem to one where the answer is like very clear, transverse intersection, then that, that should be the correct answer. Um, so, Okay, but this is something which you also could say, I don't care about this, you know, but whatever. You just, you put the hypotheses, the program aren't the same or something, and then, or don't share any irreducible components, and then, then the thing was fine, you know, I don't care. So it was mentioned in the talk of Chow Li um, that there's this kind of problem of defining. Uh, arithmetic theta series, and that uh, one one of the problems there is that you have these uh, you have some special cycles which just don't have the right dimension, and so classically the solution is like let's use various heuristics or whatever guesswork to figure out what what is the right way to define what the answer should be, and um, that, that works pretty well in the number field case, but works less well in the function field case. And uh, so one of the uh, applications of this theory, hmm, with Qi Yun and Wei Zhang, which is kind of like an outgrowth of this Beizhou story, but kind of very complex, like somewhat more sophisticated outgrowth, is that uh, if you kind of repeat these definitions of this Kula program in a, in a completely derived way, then uh, you you never encounter this issue that things have the wrong dimension. You never sort of encounter the issue that you have to guess what the right classes are by taking limits or taking hodge bundles or whatever. You just sort of do everything naively from the derived viewpoint, and you always end up with the correct uh, cycle classes. So that I would say is some kind of um, some kind of maybe more sophisticated version of the space zoo story. So uh, you can. 
do this with the right algebraic geometry in the function field setting. And I think Kirti Metapusi has work in progress doing this over a number of fields or for sure more Okay, uh, is that a satisfactory answer? Yeah, yes. Uh, any, uh, maybe have one more question. Anyone? Okay, now I'm a bit confused. So, wait, oh, okay. Yeah. I have a very naive question. So, if I, I want to like define some derived versions of Galois deformation theory, and uh, yeah, and, and how can I make sense of like continuous in this derived setting, or is it quite naive to define it? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So I think we will discuss this a little more in the, in the next talk. So um, the, actually, I'm sorry, what was the question? <laughs> you, you wanted to find Gawa deformation rings or, or like moduli spaces? Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, what I'm trying to say is if I want to, oh, sorry, what's the question? Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. My question is, uh, if I want to define some derived versions of Galois deformation theory, and uh, uh, how can I make sense of like? The yeah. Okay. But so the distinction I was making was like, if you wanted to find deformation spaces, or if you wanted to find like moduli spaces. So deformation spaces, generally speaking, you don't worry about the continuity because you you work with these Artinian rings and this you just put the discrete topology. <clears throat> um, and you you work with the, you try to treat the um, the Galois group as a pro group, and there's kind of no topology to worry about. Like it's it's just a co limit. So usually this continuity question is is when you want to go beyond deformation spaces, uh, and you want to talk about like actual algebraic families, like um, like in Shinwen Drew's first lecture. I think he explained this. He drew this picture like. You you want to go from this kind of stuff inside G <laughs> to okay anyway. Uh, C is G to do this first lecture. Okay, but the question is a good one, and so the answer I would say is first of all, at the level of deformation spaces, I think uh, the notes will explain more. But I think the main problem to go further than than I than I will explain next time is to have the correct notion of local conditions. This is the main difficulty. If one can solve this problem, then, um, then you, you, can, you should be able to define it um, using the methods that I'll talk about next time. Uh, so. Okay, Tony, so maybe uh, oh. maybe we can take stop here. Okay, yeah, let's stop. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, I guess uh, there'll be more questions at Q&A. So let's thank Tony again. Okay?